Hi. Welcome to yet another session of Dr. Spotfire. I am Vishakha Muju, your host for this session. Learning is not driven by answers but by questions. Once again, we encourage you to post your questions on Tipco community with hashtag Dr. Spotfire. This is your crew, Vishakha. I have my colleague Divya Jyoti Rajdev, Minerva, Tata and Alexis with me. We have our featured presentation by Venkat Jagannath, who is a data scientist uh, from Spotify Data Science team. He, he has his degrees in computer science and business analytics, and he has worked as an application developer. His primary work in TIPCO analytics is creating templates to enable the data science, uh, enable the citizen data science. He's very much excited about the rapid developments in AI and IoT space and keeps himself uh, kind of up to date with latest developments. In his free time, he also likes to check new restaurants in New York. So he's the one from New York, not from Palo Alto. Uh, he will be presenting today uh, a featured presentation on TIPCO Advanced Analytics Demo. Uh, so uh, Alexis, can you uh, give presenter rights to Venkat? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So hi, uh, my name is Venkat. Uh, I'm based out of New York, as uh, Ushak already mentioned. Um, and for this demo, I'll be doing a brief overview of Statistica and Spotfire and how you, they, you can use both of them together for advanced analytics. So for this uh, particular demo, I'll be doing, uh, uh, I'll be showing you a customer churn uh, analysis um, where we will be looking at uh, data, uh, a, a telecommunication data. So as we know, there are about 380 to 400 billion subscribers in the US, uh, and there's an average churn rate of around 1.9% among these subscribers. And out of these subscribers, there are about 70 to 20 million new subscribers that other wireless providers uh, uh, that come from other wireless providers every year. And if we could uh, intervene uh, before they leave, before they churn, we could avoid a loss of, of about $62 per customer per month. So when you when you think of 62 into 70 to 20 million subscribers, that adds up to a huge amount. And that is ideally something that, something that a lot of companies might like to save. So our demo will be focused on how we can find out uh, uh, which particular customer is likely to churn, and also try to understand uh, uh, understand the, the most important features there. So the data we'll be using is is uh, has 16 columns, uh, 12 numeric and four categorical, uh, and I'll show you the data in a little bit. Uh, we have about 5,000 rows of data, and some of the columns in the data set are customer status, the gender of the person, what sort of handset they're using, uh, how much data they've downloaded or uploaded in the last month, how much, uh, how many incoming or outgoing calls they've made in the last month. And the uh, target uh, target that of interest for us is the customer status. So th that is going to be a binary value. Uh, it is either going to be uh, one, which means churn, or zero, which is going to be uh, active. So this, this is basically a classification problem that we're trying to solve. And we're going to use um, a little bit of machine learning uh, models within uh, Statistica to achieve this. So Statistica, as you know, is a recent TIPCO acquisition, and um, it, it is our primary data science product. Statistica gives you uh, a lot of very useful features, drag and drop features that you can use for building all of your uh, uh, machine learning models or time series forecasts or any of those uh, predictive or uh, machine learning uh, use cases can be implemented using Statistica. So for this particular demo, uh, as I said, I'll be using the churn data and you can see the churn status, active churn, active churn, and this is the, this is the column that I'm trying to predict. The other columns that I have are the initial channel, initial channel of 
uh, how I was able to acquire that customer, uh, what sort of handset they're using, what is the gender, if there's any extra charge in texting, extra charge in calls. So you have about 16 columns, data upload, data download. And I'll be using this data to predict the customer status. So for the first step, uh, I, I will need to separate out uh, the 5,000 rows of data in, in an 80-20, 80% 20% split, so that I can build my models on the 80% of the data and test how they are performing on on the uh, held out 20% of the data. So I can use uh, sampling to uh, a sampling node. Uh, randomly allocate 80% of the data for training and 20% for the testing. So this is sample uh, sample uh, node, 80% of the data for training, 20% for testing. I will use that subset here, 80% of the data, to build three pre uh, three predictive machine learning models. So I am building one random forest model, one booster classification tree, and one cart model. You can specify what variables in the data set you want to use. So Statistica has this nice feature where you can say, show me only the appropriate variables, which will then uh, identify that there are, these are the categorical features in the, in the uh, data set, and these are the continuous features or, or the numerical features. And it will give you an option to select which, which features you want to use for your uh, machine learning needs. You can also select a lot of these tuning parameters. For example, if you want to build thousand trees, I'm, I'm right now I'm building a thousand trees, but if you want to build something less or something more, you can specify a lot of these tuning parameters. You can also define what sort of results that you want to see uh, in your final output. If you want to see the summary or if you want to see the, um, uh, the left values, you can specify that here the left chart. One of the very useful features in Statistica is the ability to generate uh, code that can be used downstream. So what I mean by that is you can generate uh, a PMML uh, file which can score your predictive models. So PMML is an XML uh, format for uh, scoring your predictive models. So you can use PMML on your web servers or you can also use uh, uh, C, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, uh, the code generated in these languages and embed it into your application for uh, predictions or um, any, any sort of uh, use cases. So it, that is the same case for every node. So you will see the same sort of application for every node. So I'm just gonna run this so that while we're talking, it, it'll run. So this is a, is a very useful feature to have, and downstream what will happen is that once you, uh, what right now what it is doing is it is taking the data set, it is uh, uh, subsetting it, and it is building all of these three models. Once it does that, it will use this unseen data set to understand how well th this, these particular models have performed. And for the most part, um, as we understand, uh, some of the more complex machine learning models like ensembles, which are booster trees, classification, random forest, have generally been known to do better. So that is something that we have to see right now, if, if that holds up. So when we look at the left chart, the intuitive way of explaining this is that the closer, it, closer some of these curves are to this point, the upper right corner point, the better the model. So we can see that the green line, which stands for the booster classification trees, has done significantly better than some of the other uh, models. So we, we might want to use this model downstream. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you how you can use that PMML generated code. So that it will look something like, so the XML code that you see here, this particular code can be used with unseen data and you can do live predictions. So we can take this PMML file and use TIPCO streaming analytics products and Spotfire to do real-time visualizations. This is the same data set that I was showing you just now. 
you can do uh, in Spotfire, you can specify uh, a lot of dashboards and, and try to un really understand how the data is is distributed. So if you're looking at this particular chart, I have a map chart on the left, um, and I have some uh, data download um, uh, based bar charts on the right. So it, it gives you, a, a, it's just an idea for us to understand that we can use it as a visualization tool. What we can also do is use it for understanding real-time analytics. So all this particular, uh, all uh, the chart on the top is being used for real-time scoring. So it is using the PMML code that is generated through Statistica, and it is scoring it on real-time data. You can pause this, this data and drill down to understand that there's a 34% probability of churn and there's 66% that this, this particular customer will not churn. This gives you an intuitive way, so uh, this is very helpful. Uh, so for, for example, for this customer, he has a 63% likelihood of churn. So we might like to reach out to this particular customer and off, give him a, an offer of uh, um, a discount on his next bill or any, any sort of offer to actually retain this customer. So this is is a way for us to go from just data at rest and go to a data in in motion uh, through predictive analytics. And this is how you can you can take value out of your uh, data. Just to quickly recap, uh, for this particular demo, we looked at a customer churn analysis with uh, real time visualizations in Spotfire. And uh, we, we also saw a little bit of development, uh, model development in Statistica and how we can use the uh, downstream code uh, in Spotfire. Statistica is, is a free trial of Statistica is available on, on, uh, on the TIPCO community page and uh, you, can, you can go to this particular link to access it. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll hand the uh, ball back to Vishaka. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, any questions? Uh, we will be kind of occasionally looking at the chat panel and answering your questions. So let me go ahead and start uh, the QA session for today. Uh, we had a couple of things where people were not able to hear audio. Uh, there is always a call-in number which you have to dial for audio. So uh, we try to have two types of connectivity so that even if one kind of misses, you are still connected either by chat or either uh, on a WebEx uh, in this session. So let me share my screen. So. Uh, so we uh, we have a question which we kind of uh, saw on the Stack Overflow, uh, and I could see that the question was kind of rated minus two uh, because this was not the right place to post this question. So uh, this would be a way to kind of say that if you are a new Spotfire user and you have uh, questions uh, which pertain to Spotfire, TIPCO community page would be the best place. Uh, now, in this, uh, the user is trying to recreate the map in Spotfire, uh, and he wants to kind of have this kind of image. Uh, so ideally, this should be something which you should kind of post on community.tipco.com, and kind of, uh, if you kind of have it as a hashtag Dr. Spotfire, we will be able to easily take these uh, questions. Uh, but I'm still uh, kind of... Uh, having this question here uh, because what I want to show you is we already have a lot of information on our community page about location analytics or geo analytics. So this is uh, this is a link which uh, DJ can share with you on chat panel. Uh, this is where uh, it kind of tells you all about the map charts. So how you can get started with the maps in Spotfire, or the documentation about it, videos which can walk you through. So sample Spotfire map chart visualization. So if you want something like this, uh, where you, you want to show kind of these layered maps, 
how you can plot these maps, how, how you can configure these maps, maybe the contour lines, you will be able to kind of uh, see the videos, get documentation here. So you can see uh, location analytics overview, what is a demo on that, creating a map chart, what is a navigation control, how you can add a marker layer, how you can add a feature layer, how you can change the layer orders in a map chart, hiding a layer, removing a layer, adding a map layer, adding a TMS layer, adding WMS, even there are like specific quick reference topics, how to navigate efficiently within Spotfire map chart, working with layers in maps, using web map service, position data on map charts with geocoding or coordinates. Even if you go scroll down, you have videos. Say uh, we had we have couple we had couple of sessions in Dr. Spotfire also where we went deeper into map chart visualization. But there are videos associated with these topics. And then there are meetups also where regularly we kind of show advanced mapping capabilities and how to uh, how to kind of create those. So you can see there is uh, mapping and data functions, optimizing supply through location analytics. So and then there is clear mention of what is a marker layer, how you can have points, how you can have things represented as features. You can add a map layer, uh, TMS layer. WMS layer, again, geocoding. So there is a detailed documentation about geoanalytics, how you will be able to, it's a cloud-based high performance and scalable geospatial technology. And it has a documentation, there is a user guide. Uh, you can kind of uh, dive deeper into uh, this area using community. So there is kind of a sufficient material available. In that question, uh, it was not actually clear what is required or the data set was not there, what you want to represent. But looking at the image, it's pretty simple to create such a visualization in Spotfire where I could see these as simply marking maybe a zip code or an area where I'm, instead of circle, I'm using squares. Or I, I, I'm not clear whether the color is based on another value. I can definitely use color by something else. But again, uh, in a map chart, it's very important what, how you want to represent these coordinates, how these actually points are there, are they a particular, are, is there already a, some kind of uh, location information available within that map visualization, within that uh, map chart. So, uh, so this, these kind of questions would be more appropriate if they are post on community.tipco.com uh, and we have, uh, sufficient information already on our kind of uh, community site which goes into dives deep into map chart uh, still let me kind of uh, show you if if i have to create a map chart visualization i can always kind of click and uh, look at a map chart so let me click it and kind of walk you through the basics of a map chart So I'm offline. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. So even when I'm offline, I could see uh, a map here as a background. If I go to properties, I can I can check these layers. So this is how you can add the layers, and this is where you add the layers. You can have multiple layers, and you can. Uh, it's possible to have some layer appear at a particular zoom level setting. So. For example, I can add a feature layer based on any of my data tables. I can have ma multiple map layers and I can have a TMS layer. I can add image, I can add WMS layer. I can have multiple layers. And once I have these layers, each layer can further be kind of configured. So I can go to settings of that layer and kind of configure that further what what is the coordinate system or uh, how. So in this map layer, I can say whether I want to show only borders, I want to show light or the dark theme, whether it's only roads. So depending on what kind of uh, layer I have, I can further uh, go dive deeper. When When it comes to marker layer, I will be able to pick up my coordinate reference system. So I can pick up any of the coordinate reference system. I have other coordinate reference systems also. 
or I can apply geocoding. I can position based on a particular column, maybe city, maybe latitude, longitude, maybe, and I can I can have that uh, geocoding hierarchy as well. I can specify shape. So this is where I can say one of the methods could be okay. I don't need I need them as a square or I need uh, them transparent. I can specify drawing order. I can have line connection. I can have uh, I can mark. I can have a subset of data. I, I can drill down like. From one map, I can pick up an area and kind of drill down into another. Uh, I can kind of, if there is transparency, multiple points at same place, I can add that as well. Uh, now, what I meant by zoom visibility is something like this. You can specify, okay, this this should uh, appear at a particular zoom level. So it, it's very helpful when you are uh, kind of going from a top level map to city and further from city to kind of details of city. You want certain layers to show up only at that zoom level, uh, or you want certain layers to show only at the top level. So this kind of uh, I, I find it very helpful when I want to kind of use a multi-layer map chart. Even it's much easier with uh, like if I have four or five layers here, I can uh, check which is my interactive layer and I can switch off and switch on these layers as well. I can even in the basic properties of map chart, I can kind of uh, have multiple layers, the order of layers which goes on top, which is in the background. Even in the appearance, I can have auto zoom. So based on my filtering, my map can automatically zoom into that area. Uh, again, uh, I can show navigation, I can interact. So there is a lot into uh, spot fire map chart visualization. That's why we have a community page dedicated which provides everything at one place. So if you are working with maps, uh, we would need more details uh, um, about how you are trying to configure and what you are trying to achieve. And uh, and the best place to start would be uh, TIPCO community where uh, we have kind of everything there. So it's not like if you are like a beginner, you will start with how to create and kind of learn more about layers. Then as you kind of uh, have more requirements and you want to go into more, dive deeper into the maps, then you would kind of definitely go into data functions and 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 there and it would be good to see these videos where they have really nice examples kind of tells you what all you can do uh then what we have also is uh, we we also have certain uh templates which we have kind of published on our community and they are specific to maps. So for example, this heat map data function for uh, spot fire, this is one of the templates. Uh, and, and you could definitely find, so if you go to exchange and just look for spot fire templates, you would definitely find uh, specific templates which are for, so heat map function is one of the templates. Points in polygon data function for spot fire, I would say this again pertains to map chart. Uh, then map contour plot data function. This is another template which you could uh, see for the map chart visualization. And there are other templates also, so uh, which you can kind of dive deeper and, and they specifically kind of pertain to a map functions like this density map function, uh, which which could be, which is simply where you download the template, so you have all the reference info about that template, what this template provides. Uh, there are releases and it's, it's published and you have uh, kind of, you can download it and there's a zip file which you will be able to download. Uh, and if at all you use uh, these, so for example, this density map is useful for providing a high level summary to visualize overall patterns in the density of spatial data. So it looks like there you are trying to uh, kind of represent the uh, density. Uh, it's much like a two dimensional histogram density. Studying raw points for patterns can be difficult owing to uneven spatial coverage. So it kind of goes into details uh, and it's something which is available for download Again, I would request you, if at all you use and you find these uh, useful, definitely provide us a review. I also want to add that don't forget Spotfire is immensely extendable. So you can use um, things like SV, map files, shape files, uh, variations of it. You can do hex binning and a lot of um, changes with the ge geometry itself. And the trick to do that is regular R code that creates shape files, but also just saving your geometry as a binary column. 
So um, we'll probably take up a session detailing how can you customize these layers and how can you customize the data functions. But if you end up doing something cool in the meanwhile, definitely leave us a note at drspotfire at tipco.com. We'd love to feature some of the work that you have done and show it off during the session. Go ahead, Vishaka. Uh, then uh, there was another question about inflection point. So, and this is a kind of question which we see coming up regularly. Uh, so, so what I did was we already have a community article on this. Uh, I will kind of uh, walk you through that particular article. So, let me uh, show you. So this is an article where it kind of describes how to find inflection point in Spotfire, uh, how you can, and there is a kind of a DXP file associated with it. And this is the same DXP file, which I am kind of using right now here. Uh, so let me just look at, I don't want to include all the data. I, I just want to include one curve, so, and then kind of show you that. So I can right click, I can filter out my marked rows. Uh, let me, just one minute, let me, I might have kept it open and Just let me mark the rows and kind of uh, filter out. I will have to look at it why this is kind of uh, kind of not working with the filtering out. Uh, it may, it is possible like it is in a very old version, and I'm opening this file in a new version where the version compatibility could be an issue. Uh, so so let me uh, just have, uh, again, this file. What I meant by saying is you create a scatter plot where you have a row ID and where you have a column, which represents that. Uh, in, in order to get this log logistic regression fit where you can find uh, inflection point, all you have to do is you can add out-of-box logistic regression curve fit. So I can add it, and then it gives me an inflection point. Now, in this case, uh, the way I'm seeing this data is I don't see this curve kind of following it, and then I would have, because I have kind of multiple curves, it's just I have some kind of duplicate data, uh, which kind of uh, is giving me kind of two different values. So what I would kind of try to do is I will try to filter this out. Uh, so let's say I have everything is untagged. Uh, let me let me delete these rows. Let's say if delete works. Yeah. So, so I, for the time being, I have deleted these rows. Uh, not sure why filtering out was not working, uh, but you can see you have the logistic uh, regression curve fit, and that's where you get this inflection point. And if I go to properties, uh, and if I go to lines and curves and I look at the inflection point, I can add label and tooltip. I can kind of represent log 10, uh, y50. I can show r square uh, values and I can have min, max. So I can even format the way they are represented. So this would be a, a kind of way to get inflection point. But again, if you have like I could trellis by and then have multiple. So, so when you are kind of going into lines and curves, you can actually have one per color, one per trellis panel, uh, and you can have one per shape as well. So depending on that, you could have multiple um, curves, and then you could see the inflection point as well. We already have a community article in this, uh, which kind of has this DXP file. Uh, it's an, in an older version. Uh, it's not the latest version, but this is an out-of-box configuration. But then there would be another way where you have a more spe uh, more specialized requirement where you could use teardata data function. 
So in this case, we are just demonstrating what you can do out of box, but uh, you you have another option where uh, where you can use their data functions to show uh, your inflection point. So that's Vishaka, one of the questions. Yes. We have a follow-up question about um, can this be used on multiple data with multiple inflection points? So this is a crest in a trough. What if there were multiple inflection points? Uh, so, so for example, the way I have seen is, for example, uh, I have seen it used for like different uh, um, uh, trellis panels. So, what you do is, for example, this is one of it. What you do in lines and curves is you kind of create your visualization where you have multiple trellis panels, and then you will have inflection point for each trellis panel, or you would have points kind of segregated by color or shape. And then you have a one curve for each color or each shape. So, so if I had like two trellis panels, I could see two curves, the two inflection points. So, yeah. so depending on how you create your visualization, you could kind of uh, out of box create it. So for that, I would need some data so that uh, I can show you. Oh, this is your X Y plot, uh, and then uh, this is your. Uh, curve and then this is your inflection point. But definitely that's why I mentioned this particular area where you could have a point, a curve, one per color, trellis panel, or shape. So you would have to configure your visualization in order to achieve that. Okay. Uh, so another thing uh, we have is we get this question quite often. Changing options in a list box property based on selection in another property control. So I have two sets of data. I have property control with two options. Uh, in Crux, it kind of says that if you want to pick up one property control, the other property control is based on it, and it should filter out that. So if they are picking up manufacture, only the manufacture value should show up. If country is picked up, only the country values should pick up. Uh, now we already had this in one of our earlier uh, Dr. Spotfire sessions, but I still want to kind of recap that. In this case, each store number has different, uh, so, so if I look at a visualization, uh, I have uh, each store location. Within each store location, the store numbers are different. So you can see I have these store numbers, so Los Angeles 47. Uh, and if I reset all my filters, I would see different stores have kind of uh, different options. So let me reset. So you can see Boston has store numbers too, Los Angeles has these, New York has these, and Seattle has these. So within each store location, the store numbers are different. So same way, within each manufacturer, there are different kind of values which are manufacturer based. Within each county, there are different values which are based on county. Now what we do in this case is we have this property control where you pick up your location. So you just pick up Boston, Los Angeles, New York, or Seattle. Once you pick up your location, so if I'm picking up location Boston, suddenly I see only Boston store numbers up there. I do not see any other store number appearing other than Boston. Now, if I pick up New York, you can see now I don't have one, two, three, four. I have New York store numbers. So this is kind of a, there are multiple ways to do, have this property controls, but this was kind of a very simple and a kind of a easy way to achieve it. You could use Iron Python script, you could use their data functions, so there could be a ways where you require coding to be done, but in this case you don't require coding at all. Now, how how did we create this first property control? It it is simple. So so for example if I edit it in this case this property control is a simple property control which has been created simply stored location. So I would insert a property control, which is document property. I will pick up, uh, give it a name. And then what I will do is I will set this property through unique values in column. So it, this property is through unique values in column. So whatever are the unique values in column, which is that four store locations, they show up. So then second one, in order to create second one, what I did was instead of using the store number, 
So instead of using this one as store number, because if I do the same thing to this store number, it will show me all store numbers. So it will show me all 84 values. Instead of that, what I created is I created a calculated column. So if you look at my column properties, I have a calculated column which I call as store flag, which is simply if store location is equal to document property store location, so that means if store location is equal to New York, give me store numbers. And if it is not New York, then I just use an arbitrary number 999. I don't want to kind of have the store number captured. Now, what will happen is for anything other than New York store numbers, it will have the value 999. So when I say unique values in the column, it won't give me all other store numbers. I could have 999, I could have some text value, whatever I want to write. So, so that way, instead of showing me all 84 values, it will show me only 20 values belonging to New York, and then rest all will be uh, one value. Same thing, I can do the moment I change in New York to Boston, this calculated column will automatically refresh. So you don't have to do the moment that document property changes, this calculated column automatically refresh. So when I change to Boston, it gives me only Boston store values and rest everything it gives one random value. This way, this way, what you will be able to do is, without using any code, without using any script, the moment you change to Los Angeles, now the store numbers change to Los Angeles. And you, you see this 999 represents everything other than Los Angeles. So you, 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 your basic idea is to kind of have a drop down where there are, there are not the stores which pertain to anything other than Los Angeles. So this, this would be one of the easiest way to do it. Uh, but then there could be Iron Python script where uh, we can kind of use an Iron Python script uh, uh, to kind of uh, limit what appears in a property control. So again, you're with the property control, so whenever you try to add, so let me edit this text area, whenever I try to add any property control, say for example, I'm adding an input field, I can always associate a script which gets associated with that property control. Every time that property changes, uh, uh, that script will kind of execute. So, so any of the properties, so like for store location, I can say, okay, this is a script which should apply. These filters should apply or uh, this is something which should happen whenever this property changes. So any each time the property value changes, you can perform no action or you can execute some script. You can execute multiple uh, scripts uh, that way. Uh, and, and that can kind of ensure that if you select a store location Boston, other, uh, other property control will only have stores pertaining to Boston. But if you are okay with the 999, this would be the easiest way to kind of limit um, um, this kind of hierarchical data structure. I have another question which is kind of similar to this one uh, where, uh, let me, let me uh, pick up this one. This is, this was uh, regarding the data fetch. It takes some time to show up because of WebEx. So let me use here. I have a data table which is connected to a database. I have created a data function using tear which uses this data table as input and outputs a new table based on code in my script. Now I want the report to fetch data or run SQL only when data function is executed for output table. So something like fetch or refresh, pull data for output table as data on demand. Now again, in this case also, one of the methods would be property control where you could associate a property with that data function and you could even give property what, whenever like whenever the data function kind of changes, uh, it could kind of flag that to zero to one or one to zero. It could toggle between uh, some values or, or, or any way you can just make that property change. And the moment that property changes, you could associate an Iron Python script which can refresh the data table. 
So ref we have those on our community refresh dot data table. So you can uh, just have a one line script, and we have kind of shown that in our earlier Doctor Spot five sessions also, uh, where you can use a one line script to kind of refresh your data table using Iron Python, and that that can be associated with a property. Uh, and that property uh, can be changed by a data function. Uh, it could be changed by using date time now, whatever is date time now, or whenever this file is open, that's the time uh, it changes the date, so it could kind of refresh that. So using data functions in conjunction with scripts and property control helps you achieve these quite simply. And we do have a Dr. Spot Fire session where we kind of went walk through uh, how to kind of refresh a data table. It could be based on property, it could be based on like every two hours, every one hour, and that's something you can do from the client itself. So this was kind of another question uh, we had. Uh, then my next question is how to implement a page break kind of functionality for table or cross table. Now if you look at this kind of cross table, it is each store location, each store number. Uh, then we have males and females and I'm looking at sum of store number. I can change this calculation to something electronics. Now there are different ways. So if I'm printing this, so if I am saying, okay, I want to export this and I'm printing this to uh, PDF, I can say, okay, this is the PDF, I'm printing this, I'm printing this visualization, which is, uh, say, cross table. I, can, I have an option where I can say, show me multiple pages, which is this, trellis panels and table rows not visible on screen. So I will end up seeing this table, which may be 754 rows. It may end up giving me instead of one page, it may end up giving me five pages, because things which are not visible in the screen, they will also be printed. So, so if I see the scroll bar, they will also be printed. But the approach I will, because it's not like I want to see everything at one time, the approach I will kind of take is uh, two way. One way is I have only a single visualization. I use sorting. I say sort rows by any particular value and I show only first five number of rows. So I can see only top five. This would be one of the ways I can kind of see all my four values and just see top five values and I know there are other values also. So this is one way where I'm not seeing whole data table. Uh, I'm seeing only the relevant information, but I'm seeing relevant information for each store location, each store number, based on whatever sorting I apply. Another way would be I don't create it like this. I remove the store number. So let me take away the sorting part also. None, I don't want any sorting. Now this is where I have Boston and I want to see details of Boston. It's something which it visually makes more sense. What I can do is I can right click, I can create a details visualization again which is a cross table. And instead of store location I can use store number. So I'm doing based on marking, instead of store location, I'm doing store number and I'm seeing only the store number. And I can pick up two, I can pick up these both, I can see both of them marked and I can see details of that store number. I can have a uh, store location also here so that I'm clear about what store location it is. I can drag and drop it here and I can pick up, okay, I want these two, I can see these two. So this data drill down kind of helps me pick up values and then I can kind of see the details in that. I can pick up another value. We had a question where it was like, uh, I want to pick up a, a value in a table and then based on that I want to link it to something else. So data drill down would be one of the ways to kind of link it to something else. So this is, this is one of the functionality, but if you are 
purely looking at something which you definitely want a page break or so for example when we do trellis so if i have a, a visualization which is like a, a bar chart and i trellis this bar chart by uh, by panels and i say or by pages i say i want to trellis it by each store number so i have 84 pages in that case each page i see like this one and i see next I kind of scroll down and I see each one. So these are multiple pages. So I, 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 I get that functionality with Trellis. I can also go to Trellis and say, okay, no, I need by panels and I need by panels as each store number and I can manual layout. I, I can say, give me two by two or four by four and then I have a scroll bar which can help me scroll down all those three values. But this is, will be something which is associated with Trellis when you are trellising your visualization and then you kind of uh, define it uh, that way. Uh, so that, that functionality would be associated with Trellis. But again, if you definitely want this kind of functionality or there is any other functionality, feel free to post it on the Spotfire Ideas portal. Uh, DJ can provide you the link for Spotfire Ideas portal. That would be uh, a place where you can uh, have your ideas or something, some functionality which you want. Then this is uh, another question which was saying that we want to open a specific page after clicking on a value in table. Is there a possibility to open a specific page by clicking on a value in a table? The idea is to have design a dashboard with three pages, one for general info, second for details, up to the selected values from data table in the first page. The third includes more details up to the selected values from the second. So one of the examples would be this data drill down where you pick up one you you have one visualization and this this detail details visualization it can be on a different page so it's not like the details visualization this visualization has to be on this page i can drag it and drop it onto this page so i can have it on this page so when i whenever i change something here uh, so let me let me remove the trellis. So, so if I mark something, I'm marking Boston, I go back to uh, a different page, I can see only Boston showing up there. So this details visualization uh, is not like it has to be on the same page. Now the point is how you can automatically uh, kind of have it changed. There are multiple ways. One is whenever you insert a text area, you can add these action links which can take you from one page to another based on what you mark. The marking can be also kind of carried forward. You can create bookmarks. So text area, if I have text area and I am editing my text area, I can have these action links. So, so for example, uh, if I have, I can navigate to another page, I can apply bookmarks, I can have, um, I, I can do multiple things, not just navigate from one page to another. It can automatically apply marking, it can filter that page to that particular uh, data, whatever subset of data you are selecting. So this would be one way where you have an action control and uh, in and in that case you can automatically move on to another page. Now I can even write a script, say I don't want user to press a button or you, the moment marking changes or if this, this marking changes which is like a green marking or this visualization marking, uh, automatically move it, move them to next page. Uh, that would be another way where user doesn't have control automatically an iron python script based on whenever the marking changes would move on to the next but i i would definitely say from user perspective because if i suddenly change and i may not have decided which data to mark uh, as a user i would appreciate to stay pick up my data whether it is boston and los angeles and then have a button here which i just click and it navigates me to the uh, detailed page which automatically has already taken care of only showing me boston and the other location which is los angeles 
so which is already kind of filtered here so usually when we have dashboarding uh, we kind of uh, have th uh, this kind of arrangement where based on that again bookmark bookmark applies multiple things not only filtering uh, but but there are certain visualizations which kind of automatically have those action controls and one of those visualizations is graphical table so if i insert a new visualization which is graphical table and i have this graphical table here i go to properties uh, instead of kind of a spark line i just have a calculation or i uh, I can remove this, I can add a calculated value, I might have some electronics purchases, and I can uh, I can kind of have this electronics purchases, and uh, this is something which represents. Now what I can do is, I can pick up this value, I can mark this value, and say whenever I kind of pick this value, do some action control. So I can go to properties uh, of this, I can, um, based on whenever this calculated value is changed i can have a perform action and that perform action i could say oh click this and take me to page which is the data fetch page and i already know that data fetch page is limited by whatever i'm marking here i can add that here i can click ok uh, i can click close close now whenever i change this marking you can see it takes me to data fetch page. If I go back here uh, and I change because I, my data fetch page did not have that, it was my page, this one page which has that visualization, I can go to settings, I can go to action, I can change, okay, remove this, uh, I have this page, I want that to be added, okay, close, close. And now when I change the marking, it takes me to that page where I can see now Boston. If I go back here, I pick up Seattle or New York, you can see Seattle. So it not only kind of, the moment I mark, it not only marks that data, but also it takes me to, uh, navigates me to another. This is something which is available in a, uh, in graphical table. It's available as an action control, uh, as an action in the, text area, so you could create a button in a text area which when you click, uh, it takes you to another page. So this would be another way to do it. Uh, then uh, there is something as which is kind of mentioned here, uh, which is different, which is uh, basically the link rendering. Uh, so and when you have a table visualization, there is something where uh, each value in the table can be kind of rendered. So uh, if you look at column, you have rendering as text. You can render it as image from URL. Uh, you can render it as a link. Uh, so depending on how you create that link and what link you have, it can actually, uh, when you click on that, so if it is image from URL, it can take you to that URL. If it is some kind of link, it can kind of link you to something else. That's within a table visualization, each column. So, for example, when you are looking at uh, some chemical data and you want to look, uh, see it as a chemical formula or as a chemical structure, depending on uh, what rendering software you have on your system, uh, you would be able to pick that. So, for example, for ChemDraw, uh, I might be able to pick up that here. Again, it requires installation of that rendering software. So, instead of, instead of seeing values as text or link, you'll be able to see that image uh, or you'll be able to see that molecular structure. So depending on your rendering, so this is kind of an ability where you render your text as different settings. So if it is image from URL, I can pick up settings, I can say what each cell value represents. So for example, is the name of country, I can say www.tipco.com or some site dot dollar, whatever is the name of the country. So you pick up that country, you are able to kind of see that image. And you can see here right now store location looks kind of a different because I want it to be kind of a image or it may be just store number 12, store number 13. So you, you can kind of use these settings or you can change it to kind of text or you can say it's a link. Again, what each cell value, so it's kind of going to an HTML page. So what each cell value oh. kind of represents, you can add that as well. 
So Shaka, in the last yeah. five minutes, I'd really like to get to a question. So um, yeah. I don't need the screen, but if you could just grab the link from um, the chat, please, on your screen. So the question that we received was that the user was trying to do advanced graphics within Spotfire. So they were trying to um, create a forest plot. Now our graphics has a lot of functionality. Um, if you think about a forest plot, essentially it's effect size. So it's distributions. There are a number of ways within Spotfire that you can use uh, the same distribution. For example, a heat map colored by the gradient would be a better way to use distribution. But for some reason, if you don't want to use those options, you can always segue to open source R and uh, use whatever packages. For example, if you have a very specific application, um, you can use a specific application that, uh, specific packages that function with the plot type that you're looking for. So I will send out a link on chat which is essentially uh, the graphics guide with Ted, which is what you're seeing right now. So this graphics guide shows you all the different ways of extending the Spotfire graphics palette to include uh, different visualizations like the area chart, first plot, joy plot, which just came out in R. The recommended way is JavaScript because you still have a lot of cross clickability functionality so you don't lose any of the interactivity, but it depends on your tech skills. If you're not a JavaScript person and if you want to rather work within R, then you would uh, go through the same one, calling R graph to create an image file using the tear RNR package. So Vishaka, if you could please click on that. This gives you step-by-step -step ways of creating um, the image. So what happens is that suppose you want to create a forest plot. You would install the forest plot package in open source R. From within your tear, you would call out to R&R. So R&R was a package that was written specifically to call out open source R from tear, which was written by the engineers on our side. And what it does is that it brings back the result of our graph as a binary. So earlier today, we talked about how the binary format can be used to save all kinds of geometries. The binary format can also be used to save the plot as an image. So once you have that binary, you're able to display it in a text area. So we understand that this is documentation which can be a little bit terse to follow. We're going to come up with a blog, detailed blog, walking you through some of the steps and a few examples of doing the same um, around the end of the week. But since we got the question pretty late yesterday, we at least wanted to touch on it a little bit. So um, again, if you have any questions, uh, a few things that I wanted to point out with respect to the questions that were asked on community is that it's not very useful to have titles that go, you know, can I be helped or help needed. You will get more responses if you start with titles like data table trouble or extending graphics palette. Essentially just summarize your problem. And then be very conscious of the tags that you use. We have a lot of specialists that serve the tags when they're answering questions. So I know people that would exclusively do JSWiz, that would exclusively do IN Python. We almost exclusively do Dr. Spotfire. So it's very important, just like any other um, social media platform, to have um, appropriate tags listed as well. So I've listed out this document on the chat that I just sent out to everyone, but we will be blogging about it later this week as well. So that's it from the session today. Um, thank you so much for attending everyone. Please send in your feedback, questions, 
anything interesting that you've done in Spotfire, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.